Hey everybody, I'm your four-eyed professor, Chris Levens, and I'm super excited to talk to you today. Our roll call is for new and experienced ODs, optometry students, and even those just interested in this profession. We'll cover a number of topics together, and I'll help you see them through a professor's eyes. Please take your seats. School's in session. Thanks, everybody, for joining us back on the podcast today. Uh, today's episode is going to bit be a bit unique in that we're going to focus in a very specific area. Uh, namely, we have a lot of choices when it comes to managing ophthalmic technology and how we how we manage quality imagery of our patients on really all aspects of their eyes. And one of our partners in healthcare is Heidelberg Engineering. And so I have a couple guests from Heidelberg Engineering with us today, Joey and Cindy. Please, if you don't mind, uh, Joey, would you mind introducing yourself first and tell us your, your background in eye care and then what you do for Heidelberg and then we'll move over to Cindy? Sure, sounds great. Uh, hey everybody, I'm Joey Hadfield. I've got about roughly 22 years in ophthalmic imaging. Uh, started off in the clinic as an imager. Uh, worked my way into industry. I've uh, been everything from an educator, a, a sales rep. Uh, currently, I'm the the southern sales director for Heidelberg Engineering. So I cover pretty much all of the south and southeast. Got it. And Cindy, welcome. Tell uh, us about yourself. Hi, my name is Cindy Armstrong. I'm the clinical application specialist in the Northwest. I started in ophthalmology healthcare in 1990 and uh, as a technician and an imager and have been a clinical manager and now working for Heidelberg as a clinical application specialist and educator. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to you both. And so, you know, really delighted to talk initially about, you know, your really your main offering uh, for eye care at Heidelberg Engineering right now is the spectra Spectralis instrument. And, you know, one of my roles is purchasing equipment and it, it gets it gets overwhelming at times um, to really understand the offerings that are out there and really to be able to discriminate uh, one from another. So before we even start talking about your product specifically, just, you know, does it really matter? Is there a OCTA and OC? be um, they pretty much all the same, regardless of how many dollars I'm spending on these. Is there a difference? Um, I'll jump in on this one, Chris. I, I would say there is uh, significantly a difference. And, and, and I think that's why it's important to really always approach these decisions with an educated approach. Um, it's important to really look at all of the, the products that are out there and available uh, and really ask the important questions to really what you're looking to achieve diagnostically. Um, uh, whether it's looking at glaucoma and you're looking for uh, accuracy of change over time and repeatability, if you're looking at uh, more of the, the retinal disease and you're looking really for that, that fine detail and that image quality. Um, there, there's, there's a range of variety out there uh, for all the different platforms. Uh, even though they're all OCT, uh, there's, there's significant little differences that you want to identify and make sure you're getting the right device for you and for your practice. Got it. Cindy, what do you think? I think the, the biggest thing is, too, is the ability to grow with your device. I think that when you have a device that limits you to just the one scan and one image with the Heidelberg, you're able to add different modalities over time as your practice changes and grows with new employees uh, for doctors, technicians, however, whatever it works for your, your practice. But definitely I think that that is a huge advantage. Got it. Okay. So really the goal for our interaction today is to bust down some myths because as an ECP, these are things that I've all heard from my peers and colleagues. And so I really want to get your take on them because if they really are myth-based, then it's time that we get rid of those and truly understand what's going on. And if they're not, that's okay too. But let's really all try to get a good understanding so we can address these things to our audience because it's in all likelihood they've heard some of these things as well. And so in no particular order, uh, the first thing that I have heard is that your instrument, the Spectralis, really doesn't belong in optometry. This is really an ophthalmology instrument uh, more suited to things, you know, like retina, you know, because I see a lot of these in really high end retina practices. And maybe as a general optometrist, maybe I'm in a small practice. Uh, maybe this just shouldn't be what I'm looking for. Did, 
this is really imaging in a much higher degree than I really need. That's a very common one, uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, I can definitely say as somebody that came from the clinic, uh, that came into industry, it was one of the first things that I, I heard about the platform as well. It was very specific to retina. Um, and it's understandable as to, as to how that myth got started, but it is a myth. The, when you look at the origination of Spectralis, the Heidelberg uh, engineering company had uh, at the time a uh, Heidelberg uh, retinal angiography system, the HRA. They realized quickly that the OCT technology could actually be blended with that. Um, they, they used very similar components. And so that's where the HRA OCT was born. And, and it does have a very retina specific functionality because it performs dye based angiography and that sort of thing. Um, however, the, the, what Cindy mentioned earlier about kind of upgradability, that's, that's kind of the full package. That's not Spectralis. Spectralis OCT uh, can be just that. It can be just an OCT and it can start at a very, at a very base level to, to meet the need of what you're looking to achieve retinal scans, glaucoma scans, uh, basic fundus imaging uh, using CSLO, but you can build off of that. And, and again, so a lot of people just automatically jump to the very end of the rainbow with us, um, but it's that's not the beginning. We, we can back that down to, to pretty much what you need to fit the practice you're working within. I, I would like to add too that I was just at a practice the last couple of days, an optometrist who uses a full spectrum OCT HRA to its maximum. Mm -hmm. And he does everything from fundus autofluorescence, multicolor. He uses wide field. He does GMPE. And he uses all the modalities. And for him, he's like, I want to give my patient the best care. And by using those modalities, I'm able to help them to get them to proper channels if we need to elevate services. Um, he's an independent doctor and he, he loves his spectralis and I, I run into this a lot clinically, especially up in the Northwest. We have a lot of ODs that work in remote locations and they have to be everything to these physicians or to these patients um, because there isn't an option. And so if they're able to use their diagnostic tools to give the best patient care, um, it only elevates the patient's you know, success in maintaining their vision and helps the doctor to decide, is this someone that we need to you know, send two hours away to the local uh, specialist that's n not within their city. So I think, you know, saying that it's only for ophthalmologists is wrong because if the ophthalmologist is using it, then the OD would want to use it too, because they want the best quality image for their patient. So the Cindy, let me respond to that and, and, po and pose another, and pose another question. Um, I recall seeing my first images from the spectralis and being very impressed at the level of detail in those images that I wasn't seeing on some of the OCTs that I had already. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, number one, is that all is all that detail necessary? How is it helpful? And then the number two, back to I had already purchased OCTs already. It, seeming, it seemed like Spectralis took a long time to get to a position where I could actually buy it uh, and not be in an experimental stage. It was late to the game as an entry point. And so why did it take long to get, get, get to my hands? And then two, you know, what's the benefit or is there one of that amount of detail? Um, I think the biggest thing is, is, as far as the detail goes, you know, the ability to measure structure to structure. I mean, if you're looking at the ganglion cell complex and you're wanting to know what that value is, um, we're able to measure from ganglion cell to RNFL. Nobody else is able to do that at the level we're able to do that. And that could be the difference, you know, for showing progression in glaucoma that you would not see with another device that isn't, isn't able to define those layers. So I think if you're looking for accurate data, then Heidelberg is definitely, you know, the instrument to give that to you. Because, I, you know, I've been in this since 1990. I've seen the spectrum of every kind of imaging device there is. And at the end of the day, I wanted to use Heidelberg for the specific reason is that it gave me everything I wanted to see. And I was also able to help my physicians, um, you know, optometry and ophthalmology, because I've worked with all of it to be able to give the best patient care. And I would literally tell my patients, our doctors invest in your care because they buy the best. Um, as far as why did it take so long for them to get to industry? 
um, you know, I think that that I think that Heidelberg, in my experience working for them and then also being a customer of theirs, is that, you know, they take the time to make sure that whatever they put out is of best quality and is reliable and no one has to second guess whether the device is working properly. The images that you get when you can see all the layer 10 layers of the retina mm -hmm. or the defined Brooks membrane opening um, of the optic nerve head when you use GMPE, that tells you in and of itself that it's worth the wait. Maybe it took a little longer to get there, but it's worth the wait because you're getting the best. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. So I, I will admit to you this factoid that up until the time the spectralis retinal images came to my eyes, I had only visualized the retina in cross-section in histological slides or in artistic renderings. Yep. Uh, my the, the, the current OCTs that I was employing at the time did not discriminate to 10 layers of retina. It was kind of like a mushed up tuna fish sandwich with all kind of layers kind of congealing <laughs> together. This was the first time where I really could say could see, wow, the, 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 the stuff I learned in ocular and, and retinal anatomy, you know, is, is really present in these images. And it really makes teaching and learning today a, a, a lot different than it was years ago, yep. because now it's in our hands and we can do it on a patient anytime, any day of the week and see, you know, not just from a theoretical perspective, but from a real retinal perspective, what's going on at really minute detail. I mean, so the good thing, because I think we really did bust this myth down. It, the, 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 this one was really not hard, um, but we're going to tie it back to it because I think that there's some more connected pieces here with regards to that it does belong in optometry. It's not just a specialized instrument. Um, uh, you know, for one thing issue primarily is most of my colleagues are fairly conservative, meaning that they really want to do the best job that they possibly can, uh, ruling in a diagnosis, ruling out alternative diagnoses, and really feeling confident about their decision making. And when you have a device that delivers that degree of detail, it makes the diagnosing a whole lot easier, less confounding right, when, when tissues previously were blending into one another. Would you agree with that? hundred percent. Absolutely. I would. And, and that's one of the things that for me personally, as somebody that came from a clinical background and really was, was intrigued by the imaging, my, my intention was never to go into eye care. I was, I was going to go into medicine, but not eye care um, until I started seeing retinal images and, and OCT came to the, you know, the, the, the forefront of, of imaging. And um, it really truly is amazing, but, but confidence in diagnostics, I think is, is key. And if you can look at something and not question what am I seeing because it's it's plain and evident, I think that's that's a critical component that's important in diagnostic imaging. All right, so we're not we're diving into myth two now. And Joey, you let the cat out of the bag with this one already, so I'm going to push back on you first because okay. um, because you mentioned glaucoma a few times, and a a a prevalent comment that I hear, a common one, um, is that probably because what we just mentioned, that the retinal image quality is so strong with the spectralis and the fact that some pretty well-known retinal practices have had spectralis from the get-go, that this technology is suited for retina and primarily retina alone, that it really come up the way some other products do. How do you respond to that? Um, well, I, I, for that one, I definitely, I always like to go back to the beginning. So obviously we're talking about spectralis right now, but um, I want everybody to remember that Heidelberg Engineering started off as a glaucoma company um, with the HRT. Uh, and at the beginning, Gerhard Zinser, I mean, that was really his passion. The, the co one of the co-founders, the scientific component of the co-founding of the company, um, was very passionate about glaucoma, glaucoma diagnostic and evaluation. So when we transitioned as a company from the product of the HRT to the Spectralis platform uh, and realized the benefits of OCT and glaucoma, that definitely transcribed over uh, with that. But I think, as you mentioned, we were, we've been kind of hidden. We're, we're kind of glaucoma's best kept secret, in my opinion. Um, when you talk about how good it is in the retina, my biggest thing is talking about neurosensory retina and, and the importance of being able to see the details in the neurosensory retina when we're talking about a, a, a neuropathy like glaucoma. Um, that detail is critical. Um, and, and when you take it into the nerve and you look at the ability to see progression, um, and looking at uh, progression of change in the RNFL and the nerve head itself, 
Um, glaucoma is a progressive disease. I think to me, one of the critical components of, of diagnostic, diagnosing and managing glaucoma is really evaluating the progression of it. And what we can do with the platform uh, is actually take you back to within one micron of your tissue position every visit that that patient comes in. And what that provides, in my opinion, is the ability to really catch glaucoma change at a much more confident earlier point um, than kind of statistically what we've historically been doing on other platforms uh, or with other methodology. So uh, glaucoma is definitely at the key component. It's one of the main key components of spectralis, in my opinion. Yeah, what's interesting, so my good friend Mohamed Rafatari always tells me that despite the fact that we classify glaucoma as an optic neuropathy, it's a retina disease. It is. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I get the fact that the components of the optic nerve, the key components, are indeed a fact of layer, layers of the retina. Uh, it's just that visually we see this big donut staring at us, and then we see the rest of the retina, and it's easy to dissect them into one specialty versus another, but these two <laughs> things are absolutely interconnected, and so, so it does make sense. I'm glad that you reminded us of the historical entrance of Heidelberg Engineering into eye care and that it did start with uh, glaucoma analysis and, 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 uh, and optic nerve specific measurements um, because that does play importance even today. It wasn't that long ago, but it's easy to forget because we're so blown away by the quality of the retinal images that the that this technology really started with glaucoma. I, I really do appreciate that. And I think it's key. I want to ask you, a few years ago, um, I was at Arvo and I was moderating the uh, the glaucoma abstract section, the, the glaucoma poster uh, uh, section. And I can't tell you how many posters there were about Don Hood's research and his, his uh, PhD students' research. But if I saw 30 of them, that would be an understatement. Um, so how does Dr. Hood's research play into some of the reports that we can get on, uh, on glaucoma progression through, through the spectralis? Um, I would say that, so with Dr. Hood's report, because we're able to measure structure the way that we do from layer to layer, uh, that our, when we're using the Hood report, the accuracy of the ganglion cell is the highest because we can identify the ganglion cell layer and most other devices I don't know of another device on the market that can actually identify the ganglion cell layer. They always identify their inner plexiform layer along with the ganglion cell layer, and they call it the complex. So where ours is actually the ganglion cell layer, which is the, the, the piece that's most important to know whether it's changed or not. Um, with Dr. Hood's report being able to put that 10-2 and the 24-2 overlays, the 10-2 specifically over the ganglion cell report, we're able to identify structural loss um, com comparative to a visual field that the patient may have taken that they, you know, whether that loss is real or not, we can then confirm that there's structural loss with the, the Dr. Hood's, um, with our ganglion cell scan and the and Dr. Hood's report. Did I say that? Yeah. So, Sorry. You, you, yes, it's, you know, historically uh, and, and in practice, we always talk about glaucoma being a disease that allows us to monitor both form and function. So the form of optic mm -hmm. nerve changes over time, but then function being, you know, how those operative changes correlate to somebody's loss of vision. Um, and mm -hmm. though it took a long time, uh, what Don Hood was able to do for us, which we can employ on your instrumentation, is like it just exactly as you said, overlay areas of the visual field on top of what we're seeing with the physical structure of the optic yep. nerve so that we can, even if the field, visual field haven't changed yet, it draws our attention to where it's going to be changing soon. Um, and, okay. and, 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 and vice versa. So Joey, did, does this ever come up in your discussions with, with our colleagues um, in, in terms of utilizing that, which, which is really bright, fresh and new? Uh, it does, honestly. And that's, and that's one of the things that uh, if you've ever, if, if any, any of you have ever come to one of the, the congresses and, and stopped by the booth and, and had discussions with me uh, or some of our other colleagues uh, in the company, if glaucoma comes up, this is definitely one of the things that we we end up on is is the way that we take all the data that we do collect because we do collect a quite a quite a large amount of data 
uh, per patient and how we're able to actually take all of that data and then translate it into the hood report into a very, a very concise and succinct um, uh, outline of what's happening physically. Uh, and then being able to actually, like you said, tie that into either not necessarily what's happening on the visual field now, but but where to be conscientious of paying attention on the visual field uh, as that patient progresses. So I, I, before we leave this myth, I, I do want to ask you both a question. And so for either one of you, you've walked us through some of the history of your offerings where we started with HRT1, HRT2, uh, HFA, and then we fast forward in time to the Spectralis, which really incorporates and utilizes those older methods, but it really puts it all in one unit. How, how did that transpire? How did that come to fruition? Was it just somebody's individual's goal to say, hey, we need to make an improvement here and put it all in one or, or make it better? What happened between the older versions that we were employing to what we have today? Um, I would say, I mean, from conversations that I've had with, with some of the individuals that were with the company kind of through those transition periods, there was definitely a, an understanding. I mean, and, and Chris, you and I have had this conversation in the past about the, the HRT one, two, three. It was like every time you wanted to get the newest, best thing, you had to get the newest, best machine. True. Um, and there was definitely a, a a light bulb moment, I think, in in the design process of the Spectralis platform that 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 doesn't make sense. That that model does not make sense in the medical uh, industry uh, when we're literally looking at patient care. And I think that's where some of this hybridization of of modularity and upgradability kind of evolved uh, with the Spectralis platform and being able to kind of keep things separate enough so that if you wanted to to get to the next level of the device. So you started off with just the OCT, but then you wanted to start managing um, patients with uh, uh, dry AMD and, and geographic atrophy. You wanted to add autofluorescence to your OCT. That was something that could be added in uh, to the platform because of that modularity. And, and that flexibility and in, in modularity definitely was, was really a forethought of how do we really kind of look at the future of medicine and making sure that we are, we're providing not only the best technology, but but really the best investment um, for the physicians to provide that care, that level of care that we were really want to be a part of. That makes a lot of sense. Cindy, I have a question for you before we uh, change to a new myth. And that is um, one of the things that I've noticed about the spectralis in the glaucoma analysis is there are a lot of different reports to be able to choose from. Um, do you have a favorite that you could recommend to me that when I go to see some patients tomorrow, this is the one that I may try first? If I'm using the glaucoma module premium edition, I, yes. I like the glaucoma overview because it gives a nice snapshot. It gives you the minimum rim width. Um, it gives you the SLO, it gives you the um, RNFL, it gives you the um, retinal layers with the asymmetry report, and it also gives you the ganglion cell report. And so I think that that gives you the nice overview of all pieces of the puzzle. In addition, usually I tell, um, when I'm training, I tell practitioners, you know, the first time you do GMPE, do the glaucoma overview, do the hood report, um, so that you have this nice little, little package um, and then when you do your visual field, you can use that hood report as a comparison, especially in someone who is maybe not a great visual field taker and the visual field showing that there's loss. You can then use that hood report to, to say, is this loss real or not structurally? Um, and sometimes you'll find that structurally they're great and the, they're just bad visual field takers. And then, sure. you, you know, that's a great tool for you to use because then you don't have to bring that patient back in three weeks and try to redo this test that was not successful. You can say structurally they're sound. We know that they're just not a good visual field taker. Um, we'll see them back in six months because everything points in the good direction and not the bad direction. Where if you only had the visual field, you would be bringing that patient back sooner, unnecessary visits, time wasted, um, maybe not time wasted, but time that, you know, maybe that patient didn't need to come back because you were able to confirm that they're their ganglion cells in great condition and the visual field was just not a good test. So yeah. um, I think well it's done. just a nice piece of the puzzle. Yeah. T tomorrow that that's what I'm jumping into the glaucoma <laughs> overview analysis after I've already <laughs> peeked at some of the others I'm on it. So I, I you know, it, all said that this was not a difficult myth to break down either, but it, but it 
it's very reflective of, you know, sometimes as adults in particular, we don't always flash back in time. We don't look from a historical perspective. We, we, we look at today, 2023, and say, well, what's happening recently and move on with that, not, not taking a step back and saying, though, hmm, I've heard this question about the spectralis and is it useful for glaucoma? But then when we stay, do take a step back and say, oh, well, let's look historically and oh, this company was born out of glaucoma. The early instruments were focused on glaucoma. Of course, they wouldn't just flush glaucoma. They're just building on what they already had, which is now excellence in retina. But it, by starting in glaucoma, it all makes perfect sense of what we have at our fingertips to now to be able to choose from. So now we're on to our third myth, and we're, we're going to tackle four today. So we're on the second half. Um, and that is, and I, I know that you're each going to have your own experience with this, and I have my own as well, so we can compare and contrast. Uh, and that myth is that spectralis is just too complicated. It's too hard to use. Uh, I don't know if there's so many buttons and choices. I just want to keep it easy to uh, instrument. And this one looks difficult. I would like to start with by saying that if you can use a slit lamp, you can use Heidelberg. So <laughs> if you know how to use a slit lamp, you can use Heidelberg. And that's what I tell most technicians. I'm like, do you check pressure? And they're like, oh, yeah, every day. And I'm like, then you can use a Heidelberg because the concept is the same. And I said, really, you have to identify the buttons that you're going to use for your imaging. If, you know, if it's just the RNFL and just a retina scan, you're going to see a lot of different choices, but you can just focus on your choices for your practice. Um, and the beauty of it is because there's so many options as your practice grows or your skill level grows, then you can increase your, you know, your spectrum of whatever it is you're using. It's kind of the analogy. Um, I just got, you know, a new smart TV and there's so many choices. I don't even know which button to use, but you get used to the buttons that you're used to playing with. But then sometimes you start adding some more. So I kind of think of it in that perspective. Joey, what think you? You know, I I, I had the same the the same concept coming into this uh, uh, when I joined Heidelberg. Um, uh, joining from another company, uh, obviously, I only knew what I knew. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't really know uh, some of the, the truths behind it. But um, it really is not a complex device to use um, to the point that the one of the things that personally I. I would do occasionally um, is uh, I would bring my my son with me to congresses. <laughs> okay, um, I've done I, that too. <laughs> and I mean, he's 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 always been an inquisitive kid. But I mean, the the biggest thing for me is if if you know when I started him doing that, he was probably like nine or ten. Um, if my nine or ten year old son can can run a spectralis and get great quality images. There's no reason that your technician or that you yourself couldn't run the spectralis. Right. Um, it really is that that easy to run. And again, it, it all depends on, like Cindy said, you know, what are you doing with it? What are you wanting to get out of it? And it goes back to the modularity, the upgradability, all the different things that we can do with it. Um, if you're just doing OCTs, it's no more complex than any other OCT on the market. Um, it just happens to be an OCT that, that can do so, so much more. And, yeah. and even once you start stepping into those things, like Cindy said, it, it really comes very naturally. The, the, it's all based on that initial image, that initial CSLO and, and OCT base point imaging. If you, once you get that down, it, everything else falls into place, whether you're doing autofluorescence, multicolor, doesn't matter. Sure. I mean, what you both said, it, you know, makes a lot of common sense because an instrument being, instrument being too complex could be said of any instrument, not just OCTs. It could be for anything. And Cindy, you said it could be reflective of your t t your television that you just purchased. Yeah. Uh, but what you have, you do tend to get used to. Um, that being said, I'll give you a personal story. So I, re I distinctly remember, I don't know how many years ago it was, but distinctly remember being trained on the spectralis instrument that we had just purchased and my one of my trainers was you joey and the other <laughs> trainer was chris wong and i sat down with this myth in mind that okay i really got to get my game face on i got to get some mental energy i got to drink some coffee because you know i'm in for some hard road ahead and i kid you not was i totally wrong in less than five minutes, I mean, in, in probably far less than five minutes, uh, I was able to capture high quality images. Um, and so I have no idea where this myth comes from, because when you do and sit down and have somebody walk you through it, 
It's not at all complex. It's incredibly simplistic. So I, maybe it's your competitors out there have started this myth <laughs> and they and they convinced a lot of people because it wasn't true in my experience. It wasn't true in both of your experiences because we don't need that. We don't want anything complex. We need to be able to train our, our technical staff, our colleagues to be able to employ this technology. Uh, and when it's easy, that that's a phenomenal attribute. And I, yours is really easy. This myth is completely untrue. Agreed. Agreed. All right. So our last one, at least the last one I've targeted, um, and we've touched on it a little bit already, but not head on. Um, and that is, I'm conservative in practice. I'm conservative with my patients. I'm also conservative in my budgeting. And spectralis is just way too expensive. I, it, it may be for some other folks, and that's why I see some really large practices employ it, but it's way too expensive for me. I, I just can't afford it, even though I'm incredibly impressed by what it does for both optic nerve analysis uh, and and. and distinctly 10 layer of uh, views on the retina, you know, I, I, at a moment's notice, you know, how can I manage this? So I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that one. <laughs> um, uh, since that tends to be one that I run into quite often uh, in, in the sales role. Um, the, the biggest thing is, I think that myth really starts with where we kind of began the conversation, Chris, that when mm -hmm. people think of Spectralis, they think of this one, you know, Swiss army knife device that does all these different things. Um, and again, when you look at the, the principal concept of that, um, a fully loaded system that you would find in kind of your high end retina practices that does the angiography with dye and ICG and all these different things, uh, in addition to all the basic functions, um, those devices can be expensive in comparison to other systems that just do OCT. And I think that's one of the, the critical components of uh, and something that I always stress to, to our consulting team when they're talking with uh, with doctors is, you know, identifying what is it that you need? Do you just need an OCT today um, or do you need an OCT? And also, do you need a fundus camera and something that can do autofluorescence? Because those things, again, if you're buying an OCT that just does OCT, then you still have to buy these other devices. Um, because we can provide that base OCT functionality, um, it really isn't that expensive. It's, it's rather comparable to uh, other OCTs on the market, uh, pretty much within you know, a couple thousand dollars in a lot oh. of cases. So, so it really isn't, is, it's not a crazy investment when you isolate down what are you really investing in. Um, one of the challenges that we do run into, however, is a lot of times they go, well, I just need an OCT. And then we go, okay, and we go down that path. And then they mm -hmm. go, well, what about multicolor? <laughs> what about <laughs> <Right>. autofluorescence? <laughs> Suddenly we're getting outside of the OCT conversation. We're getting into more diagnostics and, and more functionality. Um, and again, it, and, and it's that aspect of going back and understanding, okay, if you were to buy an OCT and a camera, you would spend roughly in this ballpark. You're going right. to spend less by getting our platform with all the functionality that you're looking for. Wow. Um, so that's that's one of the key facets. I think it's understanding really what it is. I think one of the somewhat cheesy but but true statements that I heard when I started with the company from someone was, we're, we're kind of like the Baskin Robbins of imaging. We sell one thing, we sell it really well, but we sell it 31 different ways. <laughs> okay. That's true. <laughs> I would like to add a little something to that, you know, being clinical manager and buying equipment and utilizing space, space was mm -hmm. always a yes, huge problem and space is money. So every room that sure. you have that you can't put an exam lane in and add another physician and how many practices you go into and they have three rooms full of different pieces of equipment. The beauty with Heidelberg, one of the reasons that our practice routinely went with Heidelberg for all of our imaging um, is because it didn't take up a lot of space and we could do a lot of things with one device. Um, I think anytime that you can put a lot of things in one device that doesn't take up a lot of space, it's a win for the practice. It's a win for the, and then to have the best is a win for everybody, the patient, the doctor, the practice. Um, and again, uh, being able to add the different modalities over time as you add different physicians and or different subspecialties into your practice. You each said one thing 
that absolutely resonated with me. So kudos to you both. Uh, Cindy, you mentioned, you know, space is money. It absolutely is. Real estate of your practice by square footage is our dollars. And mm -hmm. so, and, and everybody's out of space. So yep. be able to use space most effectively makes sense. Uh, and, and, and Joey, what you said about, you know, somebody who is a buyer of, of which that, as I said, that's one of my responsibilities by saying, all right, so our OCT uh, at its most basic level is pretty much the same price as I would buy from other manufacturers. But if you're also thinking about adding in more utilization for that same space, say fundus imagery, well, in my mind, I know how to calculate those two things to get a sum. Well, if I put it in one instrument and I'm saving money, I mean, this is a no brainer story. I mean, yeah. this completely busts that myth. Um, and, and, and so essentially you used the term earlier on modularity, that, that there are modules that could be plugged in and out. And so I think I understand this fully, but let me just make sure by asking you the question. So let's just say, um, I, I, at today, I, all I want is the, is the OCT function, but, and so I purchase it. And next year I decide I'd like another module or some additional func functionality. Do I have to trade in my whole instrument or is there a way to um, upgrade the one that I have if I decide that I want more out of it? So it's, it's, it's just an upgrade. Um, that's, that's the beauty of the system. And, and again, when you look at historically the platform as it, as it is today, Chris, the, the original scanning speed of the Spectralis was 40 kilohertz, 40,000 scans per second. Okay. Um, the current, kind of standard speed is 85, you can still get 40. Um, so 40 is obviously gonna be a little bit cheaper if if you really are budget conscious and budget tight. 40 is roughly equivalent to what a lot of the other platforms are at. It's actually a little faster than most of the other platforms uh, at its base level. Um, so you could start with that and then next year you could up it to 85 without really changing out anything. It, it's it's literally a module functionality that, that we can activate inside the system. So you can scan faster. That also allows you to do OCT and geography. You can add that module if you wanted to look at vascular structure. Um, you could also to that same system add autofluorescence. Since GA and, and, and dry MD treatments are kind of such a hot topic right now, um, you can add autofluorescence to your platform and, and start co-managing those, those patients as well. Uh, and it's all without doing anything with the device itself, as far as changing it out and all this. It's it's literally activation functions that we can we can plug into the system. So then, let me ask a follow up uh, to you both. Um, so now I have a fully upgraded instrument that does many different things. Many of the things that you just mentioned um, in the image acquisition. Do I need to toggle between? image A and then, oh, Miss Jones, don't leave the, don't leave the chin rest yet. And then do another for image B and then, oh, don't back up yet. Then image C, C or is there a way to capture an image and then get it all in, in, in a shot or two? So there are, so there, we do have the ability to do uh, multiple types of images with OCT at the same time. So we have infrared, uh, fundus autofluorescence, uh, multicolor, uh, along with OCT at the same time. So you can capture mm -hmm. the image and the OCT. That way, when you're scrolling through, you can look at the structure in that view that you like or that you want, along with the OCT at the same time. Um, so we're one of the few that do it, and we do it really, really well. Yeah. <laughs> and it's still that, repeatable within one micron using progression. So that, I, that's a huge advantage because mm -hmm. then, then we're back to the real estate issue before. If, if oh no, I have to move you to another instrument in another room and capture this, and then I bring you yeah. back to my exam mm -hmm. room, I said, oh, I forgot, I meant to do this. So now I'll go back out with my technician and get another one. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, it's not, you know, real estate's not the only aspect of money, right? It's, you know, real estate's definitely money, but time's money. Time. How much yep. time does it take to move a patient from machine to machine to machine to machine uh, and then pull them back into a room and then and then look at all those different images on different platforms or different viewing functionalities? So there's there's a time aspect and efficiency of being able to do everything in one place um, with one chair and, and then move the patient to the exam and then have everything in one location, one software. Um, so you can really just kind of get get an efficient workflow out of that that, that really will produce, you know, a, a profitability point. Awesome. All right. Well, so I have one final question, but I do I do want to summarize what we've tackled because of the four myths that we discussed just now. First being that it doesn't belong in optometry, um, that it's 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 too high quality for me. It's mostly for retina. Well, that just 
that just is not true. And it really ties into the myth, the last myth that we just discussed, which is it's not all about price because the Spectralis is customizable and it's upgradable um, and you can do many things in, in, in one fell swoop. So a, a lot of advantages that really bust those two myths. Um, the, the second one that we tackled was that it's not for glaucoma. And when we, when we, when we look from a historical perspective, uh, Heidelberg was born looking at the optic nerve for glaucoma. So it only makes sense that it's 100% relevant today um, and that it's hard to use. And I think I, I think we all have shared some some personal experiences, um, mine being that in less, way less than five minutes, um, <laughs> I, I, I felt like I could drive this. Um, and even if I stepped away from it for a couple of years, right back in and continue to capture. Um, the, the last thing I really want to pose for you is, is I participated in, in, in group sessions that we've called wargaming before, where we put the hats on of our competitors and really look at what we do and offer and criticize it and critique it and say, all right, so what would a competitor say looking at us that we, well, that we need to be, so that we move on, or we've only tapped There are four more out there that we haven't even touched yet. So in, in, in a quick wargaming question, have we hit it all? Or are there some other things out there that you're hearing that maybe I haven't heard that, you know, is, is critical of, of, of what you guys are offering? I mean, for me, I would say the only other thing that that we, too, we, we do tend to run into, um, it, it really comes down to how the data is presented. Um, the, you know, every company does their own kind of style of presentation, uh, when you're, and, and again, I think this comes into where other companies are really good at, at targeting comfort zones, um, and, and going after, you know, users that have been using a specific type of device and a specific printout and, and layout for many, many years. Right. Um, it's really easy to kind of, to, to go after that. It's, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a very sensitive point, right? Um, and there, there is definitely a difference when you look at like our overview analysis, for instance, that Cindy mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, every device has its version of an overview analysis. Um, there's probably a few things that we don't have on ours specifically, like cup disc ratio. That's one of the, mm -hmm. one of the odd specific ones that comes up a lot is, well, why don't you guys have cup disc ratio? Um, well, we, we do, but we don't, it's, <laughs> it's all a matter of perception. Um, but it's usually the reports and things like that that I usually hear the most pushback on once we get through these main myths that we just discussed. Um, it always comes back to that comfort level of, well, I'm used to seeing it this way. Can you do that? Yeah. Well, we do it a little differently. But, you know, when you try to kind of work it in as to how it's most comparable. But but I yeah, think so be, be, before we jump to Cindy's response, um, I, I have a response to yours, Joey. Um, and, and that is whatever we whatever we have, we're going to get used to. So whatever that we might have migrated from may take a little bit of an adjustment, but honestly, within a patient or two, we're going to become fluent in, in what this offering is. But then from a practitioner standpoint um, and an educator standpoint, I would always advise to be on the side of higher quality to really look at the uh, anatomy, the anatomy to a much deeper and clearer level, which helps the diagnosing rather than relying on red, yellow, and green to make a, 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 pre, a preliminary, which is, which is all it is at best guess for us, a guess yeah. for us. And I do have a podcast back in the archives specifically on glaucoma progression and the risks inherent in, for whatever you want to call it, stoplight management of patients, yeah. you know, red, yellow, green, which is way dangerous. Um, I'd rather have clear imagery to be able to help me judge than just colors trying to tell me something quick and easy. Absolutely. I agree. So Cindy, anything that you can think of that we haven't hit on yet, um, or have we really tackled the prominent myths that you've heard? I, I think you've really tackled it. I think it's really a lot for me too, as I always tell people, are you about the marketing or are we about the science? So for me, it's all about the science. Like I want to see as much science as possible. I want to see all the details. I don't, I, the, the graphs and everything are really fancy and nice, whatever, but I want the details and I want the, those details to be accurate. And so we can all look at any optic nerve and say there's a cup to disc of 0.8 and assume glaucoma, but that's not always true. So I think we have to look at all the pieces of the puzzle. Glaucoma is not one thing, it's many things um, and no different with retina or imaging of anything. So 
uh, everything is not always, you know, black and white. It's lots of shades of gray. <laughs> yeah, 100% or, red, accurate. Green, or red, green, yellow. <laughs> and, you know, and at its most ironic stage, it's silly that we even talk about cup to disc ratios because yeah. we're judging the whole. We're not judging the yes. nerve. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and we don't we, though we don't have time to dive into this. I did research a long time ago on yeah. uh, repeatability of optic nerve CD ratios, and it's not at it's all not there. Repeatable. I'm not even close. <laughs> no. So uh, so the. The last thing I'll leave you with is, is just some gratitude and thanks. Um, as a customer of, of Heidelberg and a current, or empl current employer of the Spectralis instrument in patient care, one thing that I admire and appreciate from you both and your company is your commitment to my full utilization of the instrumentation. Um, it is unfortunately just really easy to buy an instrument, have very little guidance or support. Um, and adults don't like to read the instruction manual. And so that's part of it. But I know how to turn it on. I know how to shoot a shot. And that's pretty much it. But continual education on your part to help keep pushing me to use the instrument to its highest potential and highest level really only accentuates my patient care and really makes makes it easier for me to make what, what sometimes are very difficult diagnoses. So I, I do thank you both for that. Well, th thank you, Chris. And thank you for having us on here and, and, and going through this with us. It's it's always been a pleasure. And and I think, you know, to, to that point of, of education, really, when you when when you look at Heidelberg, I think it's one of the things that that we've always definitely embraced and 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 tried to employ as much as possible, uh, from our online Heidelberg Academy to uh, events around the country, events with with uh, schools. Um, education's really kind of critical and key for us because we do want uh, the, the end goal for us. It's not selling devices per se. It's it's helping physicians provide the best care to prevent blindness to you know, prevent progressive eye disease and things like that. And, and when you look at some of the individuals, really probably most all the individuals that, that we have in the company, uh, when you get down to that question of why do you do what you do, I think you'll find that that that's that is the core answer. It's, you know, we we've all had some experience or, or tied to, you know, ocular care that this is meaningful to us being able to be a part of something like this and work with individuals like yourself and and your colleagues is is really a meaningful thing for us. And, and we take it very, very, very much to heart. Very good. All right, well, I can't wait for our next discussion because we're gonna continue this deep dive into Heidelberg Engineering and what you're offering ESPs like myself. And so be on the lookout for episode two to be coming in a few weeks. Thank you, Joey, and thank you, Cindy, for being our guest today. Thanks thank again. Thanks for having us. Class is ended for today, and we have no exams or grades approaching. Please email me at foureyedprofessor at gmail.com if there are topics that you would like to hear and see through a professor's eyes.